it is critical hour. Also, we are looking to Brussels, where NATO Security General is about to begin his press conference. Air sirens blared in uh, Kiev this uh, hour, as reports indicate the city has been hit by rocket barrages and cruise missiles, as explosions are also reported across the Ukrainian country. The Ukrainian government says a full-scale Russian invasion has begun. Belarusian troops are also reportedly joining the Russian assault from the north with their border less than 100 miles from the capital, Kiev. Russian President Vladimir Putin Thursday announced the military operation and warned other countries that, uh, any, that any attempt to interfere would lead to, in his words, consequence uh, they have never seen. Putin argued that the attack is aimed at protecting civilians in eastern Ukraine, as, the, as, it, as he maintains his harsh rhetoric towards the authorities in Kiev itself. Here's more from the Russian leader. I have made the decision of a military operation. Dear comrades, your fathers, grandfathers and great-grandfathers did not fight defending our motherland for today's neo-Nazis to seize power in Ukraine. You took an oath of allegiance to the Ukrainian people and not to the anti-people junta that robs and harasses its own people. Don't follow its criminal orders. Whoever tries to interfere with us, and even more so to create threats for our country, our people should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead you to such consequences that you have never experienced in your history. That's uh, how it sounds uh, in uh, Moscow and in Kiev. Ukrainian President Zelensky held a phone call with US President Biden in the last hour as Biden attempted to reassure his Ukrainian allies uh, of the upcoming measures to contain and uh, ostensibly punish Russia with efforts to ramp up uh, at the United Nations. But in Kiev and under fire, President Zelensky again spoke to uh, his embattled nation as they brace themselves under a Russian offensive. Here is the latest from Kiev. We know for sure that we don't need the war. Not a cold war, not a hot war, not a hybrid one. But if we'll be attacked by the enemy troops, if they try to take our country away from us, our freedom, our lives, the lives of our children, we will defend ourselves. Not attack, but defend ourselves. And when you'll be attacking us, you will see our faces, not our backs, but our faces. The war is a big disaster. And this disaster has a high price, with every meaning of this word. People lose money, reputation, quality of life, they lose freedom. But the main thing is that people lose their loved ones, they lose themselves. They told you that Ukraine is posing a threat to Russia. It was not the case in the past, not in the present, it's not going to be in the future. You are demanding security guarantees from NATO, but we also demand security guarantees. Security for Ukraine from you, from Russia, and other guarantees of the Budapest Memorandum. But our main goal is peace in Ukraine and the safety of our people, Ukrainians. For that, we are ready to have talks with anybody, including you, in any format, on any platform. The war will deprive security guarantees from everybody. Nobody will have guarantees of security anymore. Who will suffer the most from it? The people. Who doesn't want it the most? The people. Who can stop it? The people. But are those people among you? I am sure. And now I'd like to say hello to Ukrainian journalist uh, in Kiev. She'll be with us uh, in a minute. So I'll say uh, first uh, hello to my uh, fellows and colleagues here in the studio. Uh, uh, former uh, Israeli ambassador Avi Paznar, thank you so much for uh, joining me. Um, how do you look at things going on uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine right now? And uh, w alongside with you, our corresponding, international correspondent, Owen Alterman, uh, with the latest, obviously, everything is changing by the minute. So I, I would like to ask you both, Owen, we'll start with you. What's the latest I heard now that Russia will be disconnected from SWIFT tonight? Other measures by uh, US and uh, the EU to try and tangle the Russians, but it seems like Putin 
is not impressed. Uh, to say the least, Joav, not all that impressed. Obviously, we're expecting the sanctions. Given that this scenario was at the extreme end of the spectrum of possible scenarios, I think we can expect the level of sanctions to be imposed to be at the extreme end of this spectrum of scenarios for sanctions that would be imposed But to on what is Putin trying to achieve? Is Putin trying to, to, to frighten Ukraine or to take over Ukraine? Because he went all over. All over, he came from sea, he came from land, he came from uh, each and every possible angle. He's eating Kiev, he's eating other cities, so it seems like Russia wants to take over Ukraine. Yeah, eating is, is absolutely the right verb, Yoav. I think we're past the frightening stage, right? That's what we've been seeing over the past two months, when there was some question about what the Russian leader's intentions were. If he only wanted to use this as a loaded gun in order to frighten, as you, as you rightly put it, the Ukrainians, but not uh, bear the costs that Russia will bear from this invasion. And you're right, from Putin's perspective, the benefits outweigh the costs, but that doesn't mean that there aren't costs. But obviously, we're past that stage. Putin is there on the ground. Again, this is at the extreme end of the, po of the spectrum of possible scenarios. I, I think we can say with fair confidence right now that he wants to be in charge of Ukraine one way or another. And of course, the big question is, uh, beyond that, does he want to expand? There's a geographical element here, the importance of Ukraine to Russia geographically, Politically, there is a systemic element here of Putin wanting to change the rules of the game in the entire international system, and this is obviously a momentous event of the 21st century. And there is a huge economical uh, issue. Ukraine uh, holds in its ground a lot of money, a lot of money, which is important to uh, Russia. I, Avi Pazneo, what's in there to look currently? Uh, what does Russia want to achieve, uh, and what's the next step? Because, because if I will. If I were to be other countries in the area, let's say the Baltic countries, I would say, I'm next. You would be right, you have. But, there is a big but, those countries are members of NATO. And there is a difference between Ukraine, who wanted to enter NATO and couldn't, and these countries like the Baltic you mentioned, like Poland, like Romania, who are already in NATO. And President Biden had said that if Russia attacks even one inch of those countries, there will be an American military response. So the situation is different, but this is for today. This is the situation today. I was not surprised, I must tell you, by the Russian attack after listening to Putin the day before yesterday, when he spoke of Ukraine as not, not a country. Ukraine doesn't exist. Ukraine is part of Russia. It is an artificial creation uh, which was done by the by Lenin and afterwards uh, was uh, redone and he wanted to explain that he's not taking over another country he takes a country into mother russia he embraces uh, part of russia into he does mother the, russia he, he does the, the genuine thing that's uh, what he wants to show yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and now, uh, of course, uh, he will, uh, if, if the war continues, as I believe it will, and will, he will take over Ukraine, he will install a government with pro-Russian, and you will have a situation like Belarus and Russia, you will yes, have a Yes, but Ukraine Abid, Abid and, and, and oh, and, uh, you, you may add to that. Russia, although it seems to us here in Israel <laughs> and around the world like a huge tiger, Russia is a vulnerable state. Uh, its economy is very weak. Uh, its economy is, is, is weaker, is, is smaller than Spain, mm -hmm. uh, which is smaller than Texas in the US. Uh, sanctions against Russia won't take their toll tomorrow, but within a month, three months, six months, Russians will pay a very high price. But they should have imposed sanctions before. Biden's mistake was to impose very weak sanctions a few days ago on two banks and some oligarch, you should, the United States and Western Europe should have imposed harsher sanction on Russia before in order to deter Russia. Now it is a bit late. Better late than late than never. Just a <laughs> moment because uh, we would like to say hello to Ukrainian journalist in Kiev, uh, Natalie uh, Grivniak. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining uh, me, Natalie. Uh, share with us the feelings, sounds, and sights in Kiev this morning. Hello. Yes, uh, Natalie, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you quite well. Yes, yeah, so uh, please share with us uh, what you see and hear, and mainly what you feel 
in Kiev this morning? Uh, it's a huge amount of anxiety and an understanding that the impossible uh, scenario that we all thought would be will not happen is happening. Uh, I myself, I woke up uh, around five o'clock in the morning and I heard really loudly uh, three explosions and then afterwards again, again three. Uh, and, and I'm living in Kiev. Uh, same, my friends and colleagues all around, all across Ukraine, we're hearing the same things, explosions uh, in the text, a rocket shelling on, Ki on, on different cities, on Kiev, on Kharkiv, uh, on, on Chernigiv, and in the east, uh, in Mariupol. So um, this uh, uh, created shock of disbelief. And also, it's created a panic. Massively, people started to go and evacuating their houses, trying to get as close to the Western regions as possible, in order for possibly, as many people say, that they can become either refugees or going to, to the West. Uh, unfortunately, the air, uh, the sky is closed. So uh, it's, it's, it's right now, but it's Natalie, very But Natalie, hard do to, you to, see, to are people fleeing Kiev? Do you see uh, 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 people actually taking themselves, taking their children, taking their belongings and, and going west, driving west? Yes, yes, they yeah, they do take children, they take uh, their families and they either drive to the west or try to another, at least to another regions closer to, to the western part or to the western northern part of the Ukraine. Um, right now, there are huge lines in the, in the shops, in the supermarkets. Uh, the big supermarkets are being closed as a possible target of attack. Uh, sometimes uh, the card system does not work, so people need to have cash on their hands. Uh, 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 the martial law has been announced in Ukraine. So abundance and the lack of the information, people don't know what to do. So uh, right now, the official channels are spreading the information on what to do in case of emergency and uh, in, in case of attack. Yes, Natalie, what's to expect? Um, we heard President Zelensky speaking to uh, President Biden this morning and, and talking to you, to the Ukrainian people. But what's to, what to, what's to expect? I mean, do you expect the Russian army actually to enter Kiev and to take over? What's the scenario as it seems from Kiev? Well, as a journalist, I'm a part of many groups uh, of informational groups uh, done by the Minister of Internal Affairs, by the Minister of Defense, and I gather a lot of intels from my colleagues and from a network of, of the media that I own. And uh, what we think and what we see is that the tanks that are coming and crossing over the, for, over the border from Chernigiv region is a sign that there might be a further escalation and a possibility to attack Kiev as the uh, main target and the main, you know, as the capital of Kiev and as a dream for, for Putin because he claimed that, you know, Kiev is, is the country uh, for them. Uh, oh, sorry, Kiev is the capital for uh, of all of the Russian lands. So, um, unfortunately, there is a, a, an information that the escalation on Kiev might happen, as well as escalation on, on the eastern side of the Ukraine, where predominantly the Russian forces are being placed. But also, it's very sad to, to understand that uh, Belarus is also joining Russia in this in this particular war. Yes, uh, Natalie, thank you so much uh, um, for talking to us. Please, uh, please uh, take care. Uh, personally, and I hope this uh, nightmare of yours will be over uh, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Um, Avi Pasnel, you heard this, uh, the sounds and sights from uh, Kiev. It doesn't sound good. No, no, it doesn't sound good. And it looks as uh, those people are going to face uh, Russian invasion. I think also of uh, their capital, it seems to me. Um, the, I am especially concerned about the fate of the Jewish community in, uh, in Ukraine. There are about 200,000 Jews eligible for Aliyah in, uh, in Ukraine, and they might be in a very difficult situation after uh, a Russian occupation. And uh, I would hope that Israel has made all the contingencies in order to bring them here. 
But it is complicated. It's complicated to get them out from some some places. Oh, and uh, yeah, near near to the bo Russian border in far east, drive them over to the west, and then yeah. fly them over. You're talking about about 200,000 Jews, Jewish people, about 10,000 Israelis living there, eligible Israelis. So we're talking about huge numbers under war, under fire. Absolutely, and it has to be emphasized, you have Israel is differently situated on this than other countries are. Look at Britain, for example. Britain, a country of 67 million people, seven times the size of Israel. According to reports in the British media, 5,000 British citizens in Ukraine on the eve of the war. Israel, a country one-seventh the size of Britain. On the eve of the war, 10 to 15,000 Israelis were told by the foreign minister this morning, by the way, 8,000 Israelis left in the country. And as, as we heard from Abiy Pazner, up to, up to 200,000 Jews for which the Israeli government feels responsible. So per capita, the Israeli government has more people in Ukraine for whom it feels a sense of responsibility than, other country in the, than the vast majority of other countries, other Western countries. Yeah. Uh, and as you know, Yoav, it's a supreme value uh, for Jews going back millennia of helping Jews in distress. This is going to continue to be a major, yes. major focus for Israeli uh, policy. The Israeli Jewish story. Uh, you're watching a special live edition of Strategic Security. Thank you for staying with us. On the one side, uh, it's a greatest ally. On the other, a paramount strategic partner uh, in between Israeli and Jewish communities, as Owen just uh, mentioned. Jerusalem is trapped when it comes to the crisis in Ukraine and what to do about it. Unable to uh, be disloyal totally to Washington and unwilling to compromise Moscow's support. But uh, as Eli Ochenberg reports, Israel's foreign minister might have uh, made one comment too many on this delicate uh, issue. Let's see. Stuck in the middle, but not with you. As the standoff between Russia and the West over Ukraine persists, Israel finds itself walking a very fine line, a line that was perhaps crossed. What we have on our northern border, with our border with Syria, is a Russian border. Because Russia is uh, the important force inside Syria. So we have to, to take this into account. But this explanation of the Israeli foreign minister on the strategic importance of relations with Russia did not prevent him from suggesting that if Washington decides to impose sanctions on Moscow, it can count on Jerusalem's support. Here is where the special, special relationship comes to work. Mm -hmm. They understand this. And therefore, yes, we can discuss this with them and they understand. Lapid's controversial remark was criticized by government members, saying restraint is often the best policy. And Moscow seems to be in agreement with that assertion. This is what the Russian ambassador to Israel told I-24 News just a short time ago. Difficult to, to comment uh, Israel's reaction because uh, they explained uh, to us that all they are doing is not... Uh, uh, aimed against uh, Russian policy. It's not an assessment of the Russian uh, foreign and, and military activities. But at the same time, of course, we expect that uh, uh, this situation uh, is not misused and uh, is, is, this is not the fact for the time being. But it's not just diplomatic commitments or security considerations that are on the line here. Israel continues to act to ensure the safety of Israeli and Jewish citizens in Ukraine. As part of this effort, the Israeli foreign ministry reached out to its counterparts in Russia asking for assistance in evacuating Israelis in case of an invasion. The Ukrainian foreign ministry did not appreciate that, summoning the Israeli ambassador to Kiev. This is what the ambassador told the I-24 news team on the ground in Ukraine. I think this is a misinterpretation. I had a conversation here at the Foreign Office, a very polite and clear conversation. I explained the intention, and I think that that explanation was accepted. Between a rock and a hard place might be an understatement when seeking to describe Israel's dilemma between the two superpowers, and until the storm fades out, Jerusalem is likely to continue tiptoeing between the drops with the utmost caution. Yes, so and, and as I understand, uh, within two hours, uh, Israeli um, uh, um, Secretary Yair Lapid, uh, Secretary for 